Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Sustainable House Day Expert Session. This is our first event of this year's Sustainable House Day, and we are really excited that you could be here with us. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the stolen lands of many First Nations people. I am speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We would like to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. If you feel like it, uh, we would love it if you would share which Aboriginal lands you are watching from in the chat. Before the webinar begins, we'd like to tell you a bit about Sustainable House Day and Renew. Sustainable House Day is a national event that gives you access to Australia's most sustainable homes. This year, we are offering four themed weeks of online and in-person events around the country leading up to Sustainable House Day, which will be on 17th October, when we will host a day of free online sessions with homeowners that you can all enjoy. Uh, this week, our first week is our building and design week brought to you by the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. Uh, thanks so much to them for making this event possible. You can go to our website, sustainablehousestay.com to see detailed house profiles and tour videos for the 130 sustainable homes open this year and to book for our upcoming events. This event is organized by Renew. We are a not-for-profit that inspires, enables, and advocates for people to live sustainably in their homes and communities. And you can find out more about Renew at renew.org.au. So tonight's session, we will begin with expert presentations, and then we will move on to a lengthy Q&A section. You can ask questions at any point during the webinar this evening using Zoom's Q&A function, which you can find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, please use the Q&A and not the chat to ask questions. Feel free to use the chat to share any thoughts uh, or reflections on the presentations uh, or to ask uh, or to just, just say hi. Uh, so now I would like to hand over to our MC for this evening. Kalia Colston. Uh, Kalia, hello. Hi, Hi Sophie. How's it going? Hi, everyone. Yeah, really well. Thank you. So many people coming from so many places, like just watching the chat there. Um, welcome, everybody. And yeah, it's great to be your host for this expert session as part of Renew Sustainable House Day. And uh, I actually didn't realize it was the first event, so that's exciting too. Um, we're we're kicking it off tonight and it's brilliant to be able to come together and talk about designing for sustainability. Even though many of us are in lockdown cities, um, I, my name is Kali Colston, I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country. Uh, I'm a broadcaster and climate advocate and past editor of both Renew and Sanctuary magazines. I'm hugely supportive of Sustainable House Day and what it represents and the community of knowledge around it and so I'm delighted to be facilitating a Q&A discussion tonight after hearing from our speakers. Uh, uh, this evening we're going to hear how design is one of the most important tools available to you for reducing the environmental impact of your home and how to use this tool to the best effect you can and over the next couple of hours we'll hear from three speakers. Griff Morris who's founder and director of Solar Dwellings based in Perth and will be speaking about passive solar homes. And Ruth Nordstrom is studio manager at Suho, which has offices in Adelaide and Melbourne and will present on designing a 10-star home. And Yuri Lev is from Atelier uh, for Architecture and Urbanism and a registered architect in New South Wales and Tassie. Uh, Yuri will be speaking about designing a prototype small home with open source plans. And so each of our speakers will present for about 15 minutes each. And as mentioned, we'll be taking your questions at the end and we've allowed a better part of a, an hour for Q&A. So if you've got burning questions, pop them in the Q&A as Sophie just said, and that's you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. And Sophie will be in the back end helping arrange these for us and I'll be bringing them into the panel discussion a bit later on. Um, three homeowners with our house profiles and the virtual tours up on the Sustainable House, Day, uh, Sustainable House Day website will also join us for the discussion tonight. Robin Rita Phillips, Andy Lehman and Sarah Laney. And so 
Uh, we'll also be asking them to tell us a little bit about their homes a bit later. So a really rich discussion coming your way. Uh, so let's get started. Um, Griff Morris. Uh, and so, as I said, Griff is based over in WA. He first built his first passive solar home in the mid 70s and has been building his knowledge and experience about sustainable design ever since. And he also works tirelessly to raise awareness in the building industry in general public. And uh, he'll be speaking for the next 15 minutes or so. Griff, uh, welcome and, and thank you. Mm, thanks, Georgia. Um, welcome everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk quickly about um, passive solar design. Is that coming through okay? Yep. Okay, great. So what I'm normally this would take about five days to go through and I've got 15 to 20 minutes. So I'll go through some parts fairly quickly and other parts I'll slow down and remember there's a Q and A so I can answer any questions at a later stage. So um, basically sustainable uh, building is really from my point of view, passive solar is the real base. So if you look, Sustainable development is the development meets the needs of the present without compromise the ability of future generations. In other words, we need to think about what we're doing so future generations have a space to live in. You can have a home that is quite a modern home as a passive solar home. Um, you can actually have a home that looks like a renovation. It could be a brand new simple home, a simple home or it can be more a contemporary. But what's important to understand about 40% of materials are consumed in the process, 40% of energy produced and 40% of the solid waste stream. A true sustainable building will have zero environmental emissions and zero environmental depletions. It's important to understand that that is not gonna occur for a long period of time, unless you found a cave somewhere and you probably have to eject the existing inhabitants. And so you'd have an effect on the environment anyhow. So what we can do is the best we can with the resources we can to use the least of those resources. So the first thing is very important to analyze your lifestyle today, but also your future. A lot of people um, live too much in the present and don't think much enough about the future, not just from a sustainability point of view, but also about your lifestyle as you change your family needs, as people age, every home we do, we, we believe it should be universal access. And so think of the future. And if you say, that's a long way away if I need that, well, perhaps. What about parents, grandparents, other people that may have uh, various different issues that they uh, will not be able to use your home fully? So go through, check the zoning, your heritage, height restrictions. You think it's about sustainability. There's a lot of things to go through before you even get to the sustainability side of things. So make sure it fits your lifestyle, your proximity to services, proximity to transport, space for vehicles, or normal transport. Today, if you can be near transport nodes, you can basically do away with vehicles or get an electric bike um, or get the electric Uber, perhaps. Um, look at the type of home, look at the footprint on the block make sure you lay out exactly where you want things. Are you going to have veggie gardens? Are you going to have chickens? You know, are you going to grow a whole lot of um, various different uh, plants? So you've got edible plants, etc. Get expert advice for that. Make sure there's room to move for a family. Uh, planning controls, climatic priorities, orientation, site features. I'm going through these fairly quickly because I'll focus on the passive solar things, but it's important you understand there's a lot more to it before you get into the, the base of the design itself. Seasonal temperatures, you can have within three, 400 metres, you can have quite different temperatures and variations with prevailing winds, etc. if you're on one side of a hill or the other side of a hill. Quite different. So you can't just go by what you first look at that area when it comes to what zone it's in. Neighbouring properties, overshadowing, overlooking privacy, noise. Remember, um, you always look at what someone could build on the property next to you that could cause you an issue with losing your access to the sun or your access to the breezes to cool the building. 
So you have to look at all sides, what, it, what has been done, what could be done. So you need to look at um, your controls from your local government point of view. Again, vegetation, as I said, hazards, you know, bushfires, flooding, landslides. Um, we build a lot close to the coast and also we have a lot of canal blocks and very important to look at those canal blocks, look at high tide, look at uh, super tides and look at flooding at the same time, which will raise all of that up. So house design features. So passive solar design, energy efficiency, sustainable design, design for the climate, what do these mean? Well, realistically, they're all sustainability in different parts. And you could have an energy efficient home, but it may not be passive solar. You could have a passive house, but it may not be passive solar. You could do sustainable design elements, but it may not be passive solar or passive house. You may design for the climate up in Broome, but it may not any of these other things. So understand that they're all part of an overall sustainable design. Again, the basics are on this, and I'll go through the basics several times. This is a shot of Josh Burns' house, the ABC gardening chap. It's a 10-star home. We did it with him about seven or eight years ago. You can go to the website, joshshouse.com.au. It's all copy left, not copyright, so you can use the plans. There's a lot of videos, there's a lot of information, and that will give you a lot more than what I'll be talking about today. So as you can see, we've got an east-west orientation, north is to the top of the page. We have um, around about in this, where it is in Perth, but in Hilton in Perth, we've got about 70% of glass to the north side in a rectilinear design, two rooms deep, all the living areas to the north, We've got an ensuite to the north, so we're having a low allergen home. We try and get wet areas to the north if you want low allergen, so you keep mould and mildew down. Um, as you can see, it's hard to see in this, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but we've got double brick walls inside the home, which will show up on another slide, and we've got good airflow through. We've got good access sun through the day. Our ideal orientation in most parts of Australia, not all, is about 15 degrees east to west of north. You can be up to 20, 25 degrees. Um, and in certain areas, that's not a problem. In other areas, that will be a bigger problem. And I'll go through that. So active, passive, building materials, site orientation, windows, shading, insulation, livable housing, landscaping. I'll go through all of these fairly swiftly. So two main parts to the design. You've got active solar, your PV cells, your maybe a solar hot water system in this, the house on the left you can see. Um, you could have a solar heater. Uh, there's various different solar heaters. It can be wall mounted or roof mounted in some situations. Um, heat pumps, they're an active system. You can have heat pumps driven by solar. Um, so therefore, they're the active side. I'm going to be talking mainly about the passive side. So where heat moves through natural me means, the way you've designed the mass in the building, the way you've structured the building to use it as a solar collector, a heat energy storing device, also a storing cool. So you can store cool in a building. Um, heat energy transfer mechanisms. You're using the uh, molecules in the building materials to transfer the heat through what's called a knock-on effect. As the molecules vibrate, and they transfer through the material of the building. There is a minor role by occupants, but there is a role by occupants. And you need to teach people how to use a home when you design it. And if you're doing your own home, you need to be clear about how you drive the home. You'll still get a good benefit without driving it fully, but if you drive it fully, you'll get a much better benefit. So how can act as a large solar collector? On this side where the sun is, obviously it's facing north, and this is two rooms deep. If you look, we've got north facing and we've got short wavelength radiation coming from the sun, going through the glass, hitting mass objects. Your floor is where short wave will hit the most. Short wave is the best for heating mass in the home. Once it goes into the mass on the home and that where that gray area is on the floor, we would have tiles of a, a medium to dark gray on that floor, depending on the surface area. The floor will absorb 
um, that heat coming from the short wavelength radiation, if you put carpet, if you put timber, if you put bamboo, if you put cork, you will minimize any, um, any uh, penetration of heat into that floor. Once it goes into the floor, it's then released as long wavelength. As you can see, those long waves, that goes into the walls, goes up as convective heat, low pressure going upwards. That also goes into the walls. So your highest temperatures will be on your floor where the sun's hitting it. And then your next highest temperature is up towards the ceiling where you're building up that low pressure going into the walls. Very important to understand that your floor mass and your wall mass work together like any good partnership, but they do different things. Um, your floor mass is coupled to the ground and in the middle of the slab, probably about a metre down from the middle of the slab, you'll probably in Perth have about 20 degrees in summer and you'll have around about 19 degrees in winter. So your thermal coupling of the slab on the ground is critical. I think over in the east, you use waffle pods a fair bit. So you've got to think about how much you have um, because your waffle pod can be a disconnection between your slab and your ground temperature. So as you can see, we also have insulation in the ceiling, but also insulation underneath the roof because you have a downward pressure from the heat in summer and you have an upward pressure from the heat in winter. So you try and insulate both of those because it's like any good relationship, you'll find that the insulation in the roof is working harder in summer and the insulation in the ceiling is working harder in winter, but what happens together, they support each other. So again, rules of thumb, very straightforward, internal mass wall floors to modify your temperature swings. Now your temperature swings in winter are particular for the floor and your walls together, but in summer, your vertical mass, your vertical walls come into their own because infiltrated heat that gets into the home will rise up as low pressure and it'll slowly be absorbed into the superficial layers of your vertical mass. So without vertical mass, that heat's got nowhere to go. It'll just slowly build up unless you're conditioning that space. You'll notice in this design, this is Josh's house again, because you can have a look at it on the web, which is really easy. Those blue walls are double brick, no cavity walls inside. And on this home, there are no eaves on the north side, which horrified some people. But because of certain things that we want to do in the design, we eradicated the eaves on the north side and we increased the mass. And we, because with protection in summer, we need three and a half to four metres of shading, not an eave. An eave gives you very little protection. Um, basically, your diffuse and um, reflected radiant heat will cause you much more problem than high angle radiant heat. Most of it will bounce off. But the stuff that bounces from the ground, um, it will cause you more problems around about 50% penetration as opposed to about 15 to 20% penetration from the high angle uh, radiant heat. So we've got our living areas on the north. We've got, again, low allergen, wet area to the north, elongated, two rooms deep, sleeping and services to the south, unless you're going to have a low allergen house. If we had more space, I would have had the laundry to the north and also the other bathroom to the north to make it even more low allergen. And minimising openings and windows to the uh, south, east and west, but it's important that you have those openings that will give you very good airflow um, through summer. So th three types of construction to think about. High mass, which we've been talking about. Low mass, which is timber floors. Uh, it could be a timber floor, steel floor, wall frames, lightweight steel frame, uh, or composite. Composite is really great where you isolate the mass. So you can actually have the mass on the inside, very good insulation, bulk barrier and radiant barrier. And then you've isolated the um, temperatures from the inside, except for the windows. And that's where you've got to decide whether you're going to use double glazing or normal simple gla single glazing. On Josh's house, it's a 10 star home and it is single glazing throughout, except one, uh, one window in the kitchen about one and a half square meters and it's still a 10 star home. So thermal mass, you want it to be dense material. Brick is good, stone is good, but we don't want too much mass. If you have too much mass, you can't heat it up. So it gives the heat back 
at night after the sun goes down. So the right amount of mass in the right place. And you're looking at your volume of air to your mass ratio, vertical and horizontal mass, to the dimensions of the room. Because you change the dimension of the room north to south, east to west, and you then have to change your glazing ratio to mass. So again, just going through more lightweight. Lightweight construction heats up very quickly and cools very quickly, unless it's a passive house. The German term or Austrian term, it was an Austrian engineer, where you're conditioning space by uh, utilizing the warm air inside and dragging cool air in, in from the outside there. Passive house is a different term and I won't be talking about it today. So again, you can introduce, this is a two-story house very close to the coast in Perth. The external is weatherboard. It has two layers of insulation. It has the radiant barrier behind it. It also then has a bulk barrier behind the radiant barrier. Then we have mass on the inside to give us a very good composite construction to minimize temperature fluctuations. Again, just a quick one of orientations. You can be up to 20 degrees. Some people say 30 degrees, depends where you are. In winter, depends on the design, 20 to 30 degrees may not affect you a great deal, but in summer, it could make a dramatic difference if you don't increase your external shading. Again, this is just the plan so you can see a larger version of Josh's house, the internal mass walls, the ratio, the living areas on the north. We've got a master bedroom on the north with the wet area here and our airflow through this area. The shape of the house is designed to force air through the house, even though it's a very, um, it's only a small penetration here, but it forces the air through. And also the shape of the roof increases the airflow through the building, the same as the airflow across the wing of a plane um, and gives you lift and drag. Um, don't be scared about orientation. A lot of areas in Perth are 45 degrees to north. This block is 45 degrees to north. It looks a bit weird, but when you look at the floor plan, it's very straightforward. And as a matter of fact, you can save a lot of space on 45 degrees. You can get this home, which is you know, basically one, two, three, four bedrooms, a study, a home theatre, um, and uh, two living areas and still on a small footprint and you've got 45 degrees to north. So don't be scared of it. Again, airflow is critical. You need to get air past the mass of the building, not just through one point, but past all the areas where they've, you've got the infiltrated heat in summer going into the mass. So it's important to make sure that um, that airflow is going through all those paths to strip the infiltrated heat out of the vertical mass of the building. Windows, it's important to understand every window has a purpose. Um, where air comes in, if you have casement windows, they're great if they open the right direction. Double hung windows and sliding windows are the same, where you mainly get 40% of the overall size of the window for airflow. Uh, hoppers are not used much. Awnings, they might give you 100% airflow in the codes, but in actual fact, you may only get 10 to 15% in certain situations. So tilt and turn, as in double glazing, sometimes that interferes with your airflow. And also people can't open them because some of them are not designed to have security screens. So you have to think about security when you're opening at night to get your airflow. Are those windows chosen for the right airflow? You need a small air where it comes in and a large opening where it comes out. Otherwise, you'll compress the air in the building. Am I going? Um, I think I'm running out of time, am I? I'm trying to go as fast as I can. <laughs> um, shading of the windows and walls. It's important to shade on the north side of a house, three and a half to four metres away from the building because that diffuse and reflected heat will cause you more problems than your high angle radiant heat. Normal eaves will not give you that effect, even wide eaves. If you put wide eaves, you may get a little bit more protection, but then you will have problems with your access to the sun, the sun in uh, winter. Again, you can use louvers. You can use a pergola with deciduous vines. This is Josh's again. Make sure you use your landscaping to create a microclimate to minimize that heat buildup in that area. But again, when you're growing vines, remember you need to put a sail shade underneath them as they're growing. So you need to allow that into the design of the building, but don't put them on top. Otherwise the vines won't grow underneath. 
Insulation, very important, as I said, to insulate the building appropriately. I won't go into all of the different areas of the house, but insulate your bulk insulation in your ceiling. You can put reflected on top of the bulk to give you a higher effect in summer. Um, it's the air pockets that's in your bulk insulation, whether it's um, fiberglass, whether it's uh, wool, whether it's rock wool, um, they're all holding air in them. Uh, then you've got your radiant barrier, but a radiant barrier, as long as it has 20 mil air gap between the area where the radiant, uh, the radiant heat is hitting it, it will give you 95% radiant protection. We do a radiant barrier as well as our bulk barrier in a lot of our situations where we can. Again, all these different materials, they just trap air. The reflection is different, but you're trapping air in these materials and it depends on how well they trap air. A closed cell insulator like say polystyrene will hold, um, will be a better insulator than an open weave insulator in most cases. So just look at the performance, the R value of that material. So make sure the R value is appropriate. And when you do your calculations, make sure you're taking every part of that wall into place. The air on the outside, um, the material that's in the layers of material, each layer, the air trap between those layers and the air on the inside, all that is part of your R value. Waterwise design, important to consider those. Um, I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly now. I think I've gone over my time. I won't go into all of that. Again, liberal housing. Don't forget liberal housing. It will make enormous difference to you, your family um, and your friends who may need that now and also in the future. Uh, surfaces, low energy design. There's a little bit based on this, which you can read later on because I've got to race through this to finish. Um, and there we've got some useful links at the end. Um, and you all have access to this. So um, that's our information. If you have any questions, we don't mind answering questions uh, from this. If you have something I need to answer, um, we don't chase down clients. So it's just about answering the questions. And that uh, does me. I think I'm done. Thanks, Griff. You did so well there <laughs> to cover a lot of ground um, and you're getting fan comments in the chat people appreciating how much you just shared with us there so thanks so much and you will be able to hear again from Griff uh, in the Q&A which will follow the next couple of panelists and I can see lots of questions coming through the Q&A already so keep them coming and we'll get through as many of those as we can and actually really nice to hear our values that aren't pandemic related isn't it uh, to go back to the installation already um, next up is Yuri Lev uh, he's our second speaker and um, today he's speaking about designing a prototype small home with open source plans uh, Yuri uh, set up his multidisciplinary practice in Prague and has worked in the Australian context since 2005 and among many other things has established the Architects Assist platform to provide equity of access to architecture. Uh, the virtual stage is yours, Yuri. I'll turn myself off and let you turn yourself on. Thanks very much. Hello and thank you. Um, yeah, thanks Griff. Amazing amount of useful information there. I will try um, a bit of a different approach. I'll try a bit of a story, I suppose. Uh, let me see if I can manage to start the screen share here. Yeah, let's hope you can see this. So I'll start with a bit of a background. Um, I can switch. Oh, here we are. So this is me, um, an architect, mostly sitting on a few other chairs. Um, and this is where I'm from. Um, as uh, Kulia said, I started my architectural practice uh, in Australia after uh, practicing design in general back in Europe. Um, my first project in, uh, in Australia was um, um, a community uh, driven, uh, partly pro bono. Um, um, question I answer. Uh, Grief, I think your microphone is still on. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this was done uh, partly pro bono. Um, it was a community driven project, a museum in a small uh, gold mining town in, in Galgung. And I guess this, uh, as a first project, somewhat defined my further career um, 
I've done many other buildings since, perhaps about 130. Uh, but where my interest mostly dwells is um, in um, uh, building a uh, community building and uh, an architecture that can um, do a little bit more than just um, just provide um, a shelter, I suppose. So there are um, you know, things like um, schools in uh, various um, countries overseas or so, uh, community centers, um, small architectural festival I organize from time to time for students of architecture and uh, general public, um, often, um, often named to to benefit um, the host communities directly by providing um, uh, um, design, uh, um, student eng engagement, um, and design and build, um, design and build uh, projects. Um, as uh, Kulia said, I've been involved with um, uh, bushfire recovery uh, last year uh, through the um, uh, organization Architects Assist, um, and um, this kind of um, these experiences and seeing the devastation after the fires led me to think a little bit more deeply about um, the ways we we treat the the land we have, the the way we, we live, the way we inhabit it, and uh, um, yeah, the sort of growing interest in a in a alternative um, ways of habitation. So um, so that sort of occupied me for the last year or two. Um, um, eco villages, um, co-housing uh, schemes, basically uh, looking at um, how we could um, how we could uh, um, live uh, more more sensibly, I suppose, and build more sensibly. Um, so this little video is a um, is just an illustration video, not an actual um, project of um, of a co-housing proposal uh, here in Tasmania. Um, it's it basically re revolves around. Um, um, you know, fairly uh, vibrant community of uh, of uh, so multi generation multi generation generational um, um, setup. Um, everyone would sort of be able to begin with a fairly affordable small little cabin, and then that cabin could grow as uh, needs change. Um, basically, um, owned owned um, as a, the community would be owned as a um, as a company co uh, community title cooperative that sort of setup. And that brings me to what I want to talk about today. And that is one of these little units and how I imagine a house might, um, what a house might be really, or the house of the future, which doesn't necessarily need to have, you know, four bedrooms and uh, three garages and a pool. Um, I think what most people these days really need is a, a shelter, comfortable home, it doesn't need to be particularly large, but something that is flexible, can grow and can uh, possibly uh, accommodate uh, uh, grandparents, um, um, growing, growing children and so on. So that um, brings me to the little story about our little Tasmanian house. Uh, we don't usually um, publish or um, promote our work, but this one, for this one, we made an exception because it's our own little house. So a year ago, uh, we were lucky enough to secure this little bit of uh, paradise um, in, a, in a Meander Valley in Tasmania. And um, so I started pondering what to do with this place. And of course, as an architect, I, I see it as a bit of a, a moral duty and responsibility to self-experiment when, when, when I'm building something for myself. I can't really experiment on clients' homes. And so here um, we inherited this, um, this little shed to start with, which used to be a bus shed. Um, as the buses got bigger, the shed got bigger. And when the buses got bigger again, the shed got sold to us with a bit of land behind it. So as a first step, when we moved into this community, was um, to say a bit of a hello and introduce ourselves. And at the same time, we needed a bit of privacy from the street. Um, you can see um, there's a, there was a sort of like a mesh gate of the front, uh, which uh, I decided to do something with. Um, and that something was a bit of a public art. So as I was, um, as I was putting these little uh, pieces of, uh, of the tape on this gate, locals um, were stopping by saying hello, introducing themselves and uh, we kind of ended up, um, you know, with new friends and uh, and sort of began to somewhat um, uh, integrate ourselves in the, what is essentially a very small town. Um, as you can see here on the right hand side, um, different different uh, neighbors started dropping off things at that gate for us, um, such as this little uh, fire pit, um, some some uh, tree uh, plantings, and so on. So this was the finished little artwork, the Tasmanian uh, tiger, um, and moving on from there. Um, of course, second most important thing, once you move somewhere, 
um, before you even start thinking of building anything is uh, planting your trees because you can never plant them too soon. So from there, we looked at the actual land that we had. Uh, this is about, um, this is roughly um, like you would see it in a map. So north is um, up. Uh, you can see uh, it's about half an acre behind that big shed. And I guess what I, what I did first um, and what we always do when we're looking at a, a building anywhere, uh, we not, not only consider the, the brief, of course, which is, you know, how many bedrooms, what sort of uh, family is going to live there, or what sort of um, building it has to be functionally, but also we look at what might be the most, um, most appropriate um, design language to use uh, um, for, for a new building. We don't like buildings, buildings to actually you know, stand out in, in, in their context or assert themselves loudly, uh, but rather um, contribute, be quiet, be sort of subdued, you know, quiet, uh, yet beautiful. Um, so we sort of tend to look at, look around um, around the area where we build and sort of look at what, what's there and what's worked best for, you know, 100, 200 years. And in most of Australia, we still have one or two buildings pretty much anywhere left that's been there for quite a while. And we can see why it's been there for that long, because it's been, as Griff said as well, it's been um, upgradable. Um, it's, it's been uh, fairly, uh, fairly um, open to, to, to change as, 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 uh, as the demands, demands uh, changed of the inhabitants, um, buildings were able to be altered and so on. So they remained in continuous use. And so many of these that are around our little block, you can see would have been built, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, so, so this was our inspiration. And I, I find this kind of typology also quite beautiful within the landscape. Um, a lot of the modern buildings, I suppose, rely on the beauty of the surroundings. Um, and perhaps if a modern, building is successful, it's usually because it, it sort of imposes the least on the, on the landscape. So typically they build all of glass and so on. So for a building to really actually create beauty, I think it needs to respond um, to, to uh, its surroundings in some sort of more um, sort of complementary way, like, like these old things do. Uh, next. So this was kind of our, um, our take on what, um, what uh, might be appropriate in, in our area as a contemporary interpretation of, uh, of what's been um, in use um, and what's been much loved around us for, for over 100 years by the locals. Um, this is a bit of a, a floor plan, a schematic to share with you. So obviously our finances were limited. Uh, so uh, we um, are now a family of four, but living this little thing you see on the left-hand side quite comfortably. So it's uh, it's a small cabin to start with, with intention to, um, to, for it to be easily extendable later. So without any demolition, basically incrementally uh, extendable um, so that no materials are wasted. So the little cabin as it is now is uh, 7.2 by 3.6 meters. And it was, this side, it, it was this size because it was initially meant to be built um, off-site in a factory. Um, in the end, the builder decided to build it um, on site. So, but the dimensions stayed. It, I would have made it maybe a little bit wider, but I, I think it actually works quite well. So, as you can see, for a small cabin like that, with a little loft above this section on the right hand side here, for a little cabin like that, the bathroom appears quite large. Um, and that is because it is meant to be, it is intended to be a bathroom serving a, a three bedroom home eventually. So, this is the stage one. On the right hand side, you see stage two which um, is basically like a large um, one and a half story um, uh, pavilion connected with a walkway, I guess toilet, and this larger pavilion then has a living space is down the bottom. Um, and again, at the next stage of uh, phase three, we could put a little staircase here in the middle uh, uh, and a connecting bridge could basically uh, allow or enable access to two separate bedrooms upstairs in this little section. So, uh, so very flexible plan. What is now a kitchenette will just by swapping fridge with a washing machine become um, become a laundrette or laundry. And at the same time, if in the future um, you require um, an Airbnb or one of your friends doesn't have anywhere to live, you can very easily trans transform the, the laundrette back into, into a little kitchenette. And this uh, little section can be used as a completely separate house, provided that you will perhaps insert a little bathroom somewhere in this in this new pavilion. So I mean, this house can incrementally grow, and of course, way past this what is um, pictured here, you can um, keep adding uh, new pavilions and new little legs or wings to this 
as uh, need be without without demolition, I suppose. And I think that's pretty. I mean, the, the notion of um, incremental design is a pretty powerful one. And I, I think every house should be uh, designed uh, for incre incremental growth if you can't afford or don't need um, all the space at once. I can't see particularly a reason to build a four bedroom house if um, um, you know, you're a couple or an individual. Uh, so that's that. Uh, now, this is, um, I just, as I go along with this story, I guess I'll mention a couple of tips. <laughs> so, so you can see this is the, this is the house set out here. This is a caravan we lived in whilst we were building. And on the left hand side, you see the hall for the septic system. And um, I'm not a massive fan of septic systems as such. Like I would much prefer to have um, a compostable, uh, a composting toilet and, um, and a gray water system. But that stuff costs um, together perhaps $20,000 uh, to get it done properly and uh, to get it approved by the council. So uh, what, what I have done here, was um, was um, basically go for a septic system as a cheap option, you know, it costs five, six thousand dollars. And basically in the future, we will treat it as a gray water system. So it's a basically um, a legal backup. Um, it provides you a means of disposing of your wastewater legally and of your you know, um, sewage um, legally, but nothing, no, nobody can force you not to install um, your own composting toilet at a later stage and use that. Nobody can stop you from installing a gray water system and, and, and use it later, but you don't have to use those expensive so-called official ones. Um, there's a, there's a, a bit of a, uh, yeah, a couple of pictures here of the footing system we used. So we, the whole concept of this house was to build entirely from local, local materials or as much as we could. So local materials, locally sourced, sustainable timber, um, and minimum of anything else that has to be brought in. So even things like concrete, which unfortunately you required to use um, because of the, the building code and, and, and so on. So we sort of try to minimize the use of concrete. So we basically use it only for these individual piers. As you can see, uh, we've constructed the, the floor structure or the, the, the bearers for the floor were hung first of these star pickers. And then, then these, these, uh, these holes were filled in with concrete. Uh, which sort of covered um, the little stirrups and so on. So we ended up with a floor that will be there for quite a while, um, and um, and doesn't it doesn't need to be a concrete slab, I suppose, which um, which is uh, pretty carbon heavy. Um, little driveway, you can see it's uh, slightly curved. The reason for it is that this is not a particularly small block, speaking in urban terms, but it's relatively small for the country. Curved things uh, together with you know curved pathways together with clever planting will create a series of um, of uh, or sequ sequence of, of smaller spaces. So it's kind of the trickery of used in Japanese gardens and similar. It will basically in, it, it, it increases the perceived space and um, and creates a bit of a you know enables a bit of a journey towards the house as opposed to one straight line, which um, would tend to shrink everything and make everything seem smaller and more constrained. This is the frame. Everything is um, untreated um, plantation uh, pine here, uh, protected from rot and, and, and condensation solely by design. So we don't see a reason, and we actually tried, I would not be able to afford this on a client house because it's, it's a liability, but on my own I can. So I'm basically testing whether it is possible, whether it is actually viable uh, to, to use untreated timber as opposed to buying that green stuff that travels uh, to Australia sometimes from Poland and other Baltic countries, the Q is in the name. Um, I'm not sure why Tasmania or Australia would need to bring in uh, timber from Europe. Um, Cost-wise, we saved ourselves a lot of cost and also with the current material shortages internationally, um, this house was delivered in two months um, and it cost um, $80,000, which is what we would we were quoted for a, for a project home of the same, same size, which would be half from overseas material-wise and it would probably still be under construction now. So it's actually, this house demonstrates that it's completely viable to, to deliver um, a cheap or affordable home um, built from local materials. Um, this is a little bit under construction. <clears throat> um, a few different details were tried. Um, it's it's a, a notorious problem. Uh, condensation is a notorious problem, particularly in Tasmania, but in many other places in Australia, um, basically, um, water droplets forming inside of your wall cavities or uh, in your roof uh, causing causing wood, your timber to rot and and uh, and devaluing your property um, so we sort of 
testing different ways on site. We were sort of doing these one-to-one -one models with the builders, trying to figure out how to protect the, the walls and the cavities from condensation and at the same time from um, embers ingress. And all these details and these plans are actually available um, as open source um, to the public. So hopefully it'll be, be, be useful. We came up with some interesting um, ideas uh, that were completely legal and, and approved uh, by, by our building surveyor or certifier in some other states. Um, and uh, interestingly, all the insulation in the house is sheep wool. So um, this product, I'm not too happy with that we ended up using because it contains some small amount of plastic to bind the sheep wool together. So I'm a bit of a purist uh, when it comes to this house, but nevertheless, most of this is sheep wool and it's quite a wonderful little insulating uh, material, doesn't cost much. It can be produced locally. On the extension, we will use pure sheep wool, not bound in bats like this. But even this product is probably better than uh, much of the other stuff that's um, that's available. And it's it's local. It's um, made in Melbourne, I believe this, but um, it's made from um, Tassie, Tassie sheep, so uh, Tassie sheep, so yeah, uh, semi-local. And this is uh, the cladding. So again, no treatment. Um, the whole house is basically it has no chemical treatment in whatsoever, and absolute minimum amount of plastic. So you can see this isolation. Again, we were forced to use some some vapor permeable wrap here. So that's um, that's probably some plastic that you would have to remove if the house were to be composted, but uh, otherwise the house is completely edible or almost edible. Um, if you leave this house, if you strip this uh, paper out and some of the internals like wires and pipes and the kitchen and bathroom equipment, this house can basically decompose into an organic garden. It would take uh, if a moment, but, um, but it is compostable. So these weatherboards are macrocarpa pine. Um, it's known for its self-preserving properties. It's full of oil um, that, that um, basically um, anecdotally enables the untreated weatherboard to last um, decades. So I will let you know in 20, 30 years how that went. Uh, but it's quite exciting that you don't actually have to paint anything, at least uh, for me. Um, this is the interior. So these are the two only items that are actually not local uh, per se. Cheapest bunning styles and on the right-hand side and bow. Um, on the left hand side, you see shamefully IKEA kitchen. Um, again, we are uh, not rich, so <laughs> that was uh, that was what we did. This will eventually become a laundry, of course. So again, this is not, doesn't have to be particularly durable or anything. It's it's a laundry, um, doesn't get too much of a hard use. Um, and one thing that I would say, like if if you do save all this money uh, building a cheap home like us, um, perhaps invest in a one tree. That, that what we did, and I, I don't regret it. You have. You know, people people um, build little homes and then they spend a couple, um, three, four thousand on a little pergola so they have some shade. A tree like this will give you shade for a picnic. I don't know, it's about three, four meters in diameter already and it costs a thousand bucks. So I did buy this tree and wouldn't regret it and wouldn't, would, yeah, I'd do it again in any any place where, where you don't have trees already. Um, it gives you kind of a focal point and, and something to watch and enjoy and you don't have to wait 10 years. Uh, all the other trees are tiny, you know, cheap little things and they'll, they'll grow as, um, as, 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 as um, years go by. Uh, yeah, a few pictures of the finished thing. So we call it Tasmanian house because it's ultimately made of Tasmanian materials. You can see um, galvanized steel, inevitable sort of um, um, unavoidable evil. Um, but it is probably one of the more sustainable um, roofing and, and, and water tank uh, materials. We also used it for the subfloor enclosure. Along this little uh, flashing, there's 20 mil gap, which enables uh, ventilation of the subfloor. And also the concreters waste uh, plastic liner is laid on the floor under the house. So there's minimum of rising damp. And with the ventilation, the subfloor timber is protected from, from, the, from the wet rot. And this little box window, again, like this is an architect's house. If you want to save money further, I'm sure this house could be, I mean, this was built for 80. Uh, it could probably build something like this for less than that by a builder if you don't do these little architectural moves. And if you build it yourself, I, I would imagine this would cost 30, 30 grand, you know, 40 grand in materials. So it's, it's fairly ach achievable. And so, yeah, so my hope is that more people will build these little cabins, um, um, that more families will be able to to basically, you know, get into inside their own homes uh, and not renting forever. And then this house can, of course, as I demonstrated, grow in indefinitely, really. 
uh, when finances and 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 need need come uh, comes. Um, and these homes could be, and in my view, should be built on a, on one block of land, you know, owned by a company. And there's no reason why four or five families couldn't form a company and build little pavilions like these interconnected. So legally, they are still one house, but you can have four people, four, four families living so-called one house in complete privacy and comfort. And it will cost a fraction of uh, what uh, is uh, currently presented as the cheapest option, which uh, tends to be in, a, in the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, this is a bit of a look inside, so you can see, you know, not, nothing much, nothing, nothing too special, but it's a really comfortable space. And we lived in, we live here, I work from here even, and um, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been absolutely uh, a pleasure and joy, and and not not constrained, as it might seem. Upstairs, as you can see, people put bands. We treat it as um, a, we call it a climb up robe. Uh, it's more comfortable to climb up into my robe once a day than you know every time I want to go to bed. So our bed is downstairs. You can see it here on the left-hand side. It's a fold-out bed. It's usually just folded out. It sleeps four of us comfortably, um, but hopefully next year we will have another room so we don't have to sleep all in one bed. But the kids are like two years old and two years old and, and a zero, so um, not a problem at the moment. But yeah, um, so that's that. Um, and there's a bit of an overview, so you can see the, the, the art. You can call it that, and a, a bit of a bit of a house in, in the back, a couple of night shots. And very quickly now, I'll I just touch on the next um, on, on the sort of vision for a continuation of this little project. So we call it a forty wall house. And the idea is that I'll continue prototyping and self experimenting on this little project. Um, as, as long as my wife um, allows. And uh, so what I'm really excited about is, uh, you, you know, looking for some alternative materials for construction, ideally things that are otherwise considered waste. So here, here you are looking at my recent experiment with wood chips from the local sawmills. So these are wood chips and uh, sawdust mixed with lime. And uh, this is some concrete in various, uh, some cement in various um, uh, proportions. And I'm hoping to find a material that would uh, work similarly to hempcrete, which is an amazing material, but not everywhere we have enough hemp growing at the moment. Uh, but we have lots of uh, wood chips and they usually are just burned as a waste material. So I'm looking into using some of these in my new house. But there's so many different materials that I'd like to test that uh, one house is not quite enough. So what I decided to do with the next house is um, to use traditional sort of massive timber frame for structure and then build a type of or kind of uh, curtain wall around it, divided, dividing the, the facade into, uh, you know, 40, let's say, panels. And each of these panels will allow me then to, to test a different material. So you can see some local stone here, some local brick, you know, there's maybe green walls, some types of weatherboard, maybe some wood chip, wood chip panels and so on. And so as time goes by, these wheel balls will um, you know, be removed as they fail or they will be, be, be kept and I will monitor them and, um, and you know, measure inside and outside temperature and measure the humidity in, within um, and uh, monitor the durability in weather. We get some crazy weather here. So I'm imagining that this will be quite a useful uh, project to others and this will, all this information will be published online and made uh, made uh, made um, available uh, to be freely used by anybody else and also people can come to me with their ideas and I might test them on one of these panels and so as we go the house will transform and change um, eventually what will happen in this house I'm hoping to have these bedrooms upstairs as you can see on the section here um, and make this make this uh, space uh, habitable officially but to enable me all this testing, I can't really pass it by, you know, like legally I can't pass this as a dwelling. So we'll start treating this as a workshop. So it's nominally going to be a shed, but at one, some point in the future, when I have um, satisfied myself um, with um, finding the best possible materials, maybe I'll choose two or three, um, swap all the panels that are sort of not performing that well with these uh, materials that do perform well, and I will then, um, legally um, renovate this into a habitable space um, so that it is um, so that it is completely legal to, uh, to occupy. So as you can see right inside, it's the current proposal where it is just a workshop and what hands on is the one, one time in the future possible dwelling. Uh, and just to close, I hope I didn't bore you too much, but um, 
just to close, this is the domain name where or the website where I will soon be launching the um, um, the project, the 40 walls house, as I call it. And on the right hand side is the co-housing, the eco villages um, um, a website and project um, somewhat you know presented. And um, we are we're looking for investors. Uh, we have a number of people who are interested in, in, in living in, in such a setup, but uh, it, it's often quite hard to get 40 people together and and uh, and find a block that all, everyone, everyone wants to buy. So we wound it back a little bit, uh, the idea of buying as a big group. Um, what we're trying to do now is find, you know, um, a good investor developer um, who wants to make a bit of money and do something good for the planet and for, for um, yeah, for the society. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks, Yuri. Uh, I can assure you that we were absolutely not bored. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for the imagery that you shared and also your thoughtful and inspiring story. And I, I just, I'm not the only one, I'm sure, that wants one of those little cubby houses at my place. And uh, yeah, I really um, just think that your considerations around priorities and, and new ways to pursue sustainable design into the future and the iterative approach that you've taken, lots of questions, I'm sure, heading to the Q&A. So please um, put your questions there if you have any for Yuri uh, or for Griff, who you've already heard from. And I, I know I can watch the kind of ticker and can see a, a, quite a few people have joined us for this webinar in the past 30 minutes or so. My name is Kalia Colston. I'm your host this evening for this Sustainable Health Day Experts event focused on designing for sustainability. And uh, if you want to ask a question, the Q&A is there for that and we'll come to those very shortly. But first, we want to hear from our third speaker. Uh, really pleased to introduce you to Ruth Nordstrom, who is a studio manager at Suho, and she works to empower building occupants, which is a hugely refreshing place to be coming from. And uh, over to you, Ruth, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you all for having me. Um, I can probably second what you just said, um, Jera. that was quite an amazing presentation. I really enjoyed it um, as a fellow person in that field as well. Uh, it's beautiful. So let me just share my screen here. Uh, so my presentation will take slightly different um, cue than the other two because um, Soho for the last 15 years has done a lot of research on different types of buildings and things um, and also playing into what I believe is going to be another presentation um, possibly tomorrow um, regarding you know how much does it cost to actually improve houses uh, to a more energy efficient means uh, and what we try to do and, and one thing that I love about my role is um, trying to prove to people that it, it does very much come down to design at the first instance um, and making sure that you're adopting a lot of those principles that um, also Griff touched on before as well um, because if we're not doing that from the outset then all we can do is just band-aid remedy the house and um, you know and that's where the, the prices increase quite a bit. Um, so I've been asked to talk today, um, particularly about the 10 star home that we built in Adelaide, which is, is a prototype home that's not meant to be a market ready home. Um, and also its neighbour, which is a 8.2 star home. Um, so both of these homes were built as part of a partnership endeavour with a lot of different partners. I think we've got about 19, 20 different partners on this project. Um, and essentially what we're trying to prove is, um, you know, whether the rating systems work, they're, they're a as designed model, they're not an as built yet. Um, and if we can get enough information out of these houses to actually pressure the government to actually start um, adopting some of these overseas examples um, of rating and analysis on house, um, or giving them a, a particular you know, U value or something like that, then we can really actually change the industry. And I'm really, really hoping that in my career um, that I, you know, 20 years left or something, uh, that I can actually see the change happening faster. Um, I don't want Australia to make the same mistake that um, has happened overseas um, or is currently happening in New Zealand where a lot of houses, the uh, insulation was increased, but, or, or in essence, the star rating. 
Um, and then we get a lot of construction waste because buildings have to be torn down and redone. So uh, our approach is to bring uh, ratings up in a very passive way, but then also um, use a lot of principles that are tried and tested overseas to actually make sure that we have a very longer lasting product. Um, so just to make a bit of a point about the difference in the NATHERS rating uh, levels and, and you know, to visualise it, I guess, for people rather than just putting figures up there. Um, so essentially where the, the industry sits at the moment is six stars um, as the basic requirement for housing. Um, that soon is going to be going up to seven stars. However, uh, there will be a bit of a break in period for a lot of builders. And again, it comes down to uh, like the property council and um, other associations trying to limit the impact on cost to people. Uh, we, we can see that there's a lot of value in increasing the star rating. It doesn't actually have to cost anything extra. And I've done a few little examples that I'll show you as well. Uh, so essentially, you know, in terms of how many people are, or, you know, how much energy it takes to uh, power a six star house, we've, we've essentially got about 32 thereabouts um, people in a six star house compared to one in a 10 star house. Um, so it's quite traumatic. You can power 32 10 star houses for the same power of a six star house. Um, and then looking at the other star rating, so seven is the sort of dark gray color here, um, the number of people lessen and the higher you get up that scale, the better you are, obviously. We think that it's completely viable for people to start aiming for, you know, around about an eight star house uh, with not too much extra cost involved as well. Um, so these two graphs on the right here were actually um, published actually by my boss a couple of years ago, but I've made them look a little bit more pretty. Uh, you will notice that the axis on the hours is different on left and right. So I'll just highlight that for you now. Um, so essentially the difference between the star ratings that are required for getting your building approved, um, the six stars basically, there's a very large window um, where that house is actually going to be over 25 degrees for more hours in the year than what you would like. So it's not as comfortable. Um, a 10 star home essentially tries to put a lot of those hours um, throughout the year within the sort of 18 to 22 mark and not fluctuate out the other areas here. So like say 13 degrees, all the way up to 36 degrees in some of the simulations that you get in a, a lower house. Um, and the reason it's important to try to achieve these higher ratings and have some of the other considerations that you have in uh, both Griff and Jury's presentation is as we start increasing the insulation value uh, on the houses, then we also run the risk of um, having buildings that sweat and rot. New Zealand is going through it currently, unfortunately, and I, I really, as I said, I want to get us past that really quickly. Um, so a six star house, the calculation is that it essentially requires 96 megajoules per metre square per annum, um, and a 10 star requires three, so it's quite dramatically different. Um, a lot of the as design houses are actually uh, not taking into account um, air tightness on the house, so how much the building leaks. And you can actually source a, a publication that was done by the CSIRO a number of years ago, and it actually gave you the average of Australian houses that were around about the 12 air changes per hour mark, which means that, that um, pretty much everything in Australia at that point was like a leaky tent. Um, the, the, the standards of that have improved, um, and we're seeing a lot of um, new construction types in Australia, and it's really good actually also that Jerry mentioned things like hempcrete, uh, you know, wood pulp or wood fiber, um, because those sorts of materials are actually really good for super insulating the building and getting that star rating up without the sweating factor. So it's, it's a really good thing that we're seeing right now. Um, so both of these houses, but particularly the 10 star home was done so that we could start monitoring parts of the rating that we think should be there. Uh, so indoor health, 
So uh, there is a lot of um, increase in dust mites as the humidity increases inside some buildings as they sweat. Uh, they're not properly ventilated. Um, and you can see a good example of um, the actual air being cleaned in the little image on the right there as well. Um, so having um, fresh air introduction into a house is, is very, very important. Um, that filter that's actually on the left uh, was actually after a bushfire came through um, very close to the house up in the hills. Um, and then the air going out still had a little bit of dust uh, going through, but you can see it's a lot cleaner than otherwise we'd be breathing in. Um, the advantage of these sorts of systems, uh, or I think um, possibly Griff referred to it as being an active system, uh, is that we're continually having fresh air, but it's controlled and it's being brought in in such a way that we're actually not um, losing that passive uh, energy that we're creating inside of the building. Uh, we're also monitoring air pressure, which is to do with air tightness, um, also to do with like if a window opens or something like that. Carbon dioxide, which can build up inside of a house. Um, ventilation, uh, should the pressure or the humidity increase. So there's humidity sensors in there that um, bump up the HRV or can open windows to address that. Uh, and then also shading and lighting. Uh, I am very <laughs> badly um, a sufferer, sufferer of asthma and respiratory issues. My son is as well, unfortunately. Um, so I am, I'm very, very keen to see a lot of other people that I speak to uh, that come to us for low allergen houses actually adopt some of these strategies in a small house. Um, I've put a couple of stats on there for you. So the example of the six star home, um, again, as designed, um, assumes a, a sort of general air tightness of around about 12, might be a little bit more, a little bit less, but it's quite high. Um, and then what I've broken, that down to is generally the kilowatt hours use um, and then used um, an online conversion which actually gives you the emissions. So the reason I've done this is that um, there is a um, an article out there that actually uh, is on your home uh, website yourhome.gov and it actually says that you can get um, benefits and uh, essentially lose less energy um, by having air tightness in there. Um, coincidentally, also, we have a sort of offshoot of our company who's been testing the air tightness on the star ratings, and it, it can actually bump up your star rating by, you know, at least one star if you have a more airtight approach as well. Um, so, again, you can see the difference in the emissions and also the, the kilowatt hours, which then translate to money, of course. Um, but it's a really good way of demonstrating how those little steps that we can make um, in achieving a higher star rating can also um, benefit cost elsewhere. And I absolutely loved the jury actually brought up about adaptability on houses because that's something that I, I really am an advocate for and like to push is that um, I want to see as many people into a sustainable home. So one of those things that we can do is create a smaller home with a smaller footprint um, get it to a better star rating and then they can afford to adapt and build on. Um, the more years that they're outside of a, a poor performing home, the healthier they're going to be as well. Um, I have also put on here for you that essentially there's, there's a limit to how much is actually put in the rating. Um, so a six star home is essentially as designed, it indicates that there's fans inside. Um, there's insulation loss model generally. So if you had uh, like a range hood and then a blanket taken out, um, then it, it might show that there's loss. Um, also the window to wall ratio is of course in there um, by not having massive amounts of glazing and, and doing it uh, quite you know, rationally in your design, it does make a huge difference. Uh, glazing assumptions. Um, so I have been noticing with a lot of the optimizations that we've been doing recently and also um, working on a TV show where we've been optimizing um, at speed, quite a lot of designs up to seven stars, um, is that the programs are now starting to mimic the properties of um, essentially losing the insulation value should there be some bridging through two different materials against each other. Uh, to put it in simple terms, but 
Um, we, we do see that as something that's quite big, big because um, there is a number of factors that actually affect your insulation value. And if your builder isn't actually putting them together correctly or they're getting moisture in, um, Jury touched on that as well, um, then your R value or your insulation value that you've poured all your money into decreases, um, which is a huge issue and also potentially could rot and then have to be replaced. Um, we're also looking at openability, so again, ventilation in other ways, or um, that, that lovely lifestyle that Australians have of indoor-outdoor. Uh, the 10-star really pushes that a lot. We tried to break up the space with a lot of natural lighting, so we didn't have to put artificial lighting on. Um, insulation, obviously. So we focus on a lot of our designs. We, we think that a lot of the volume market could actually mimic this as well. Um, is essentially not relying on your ceiling level for the insulation, um, bumping it up to the ceiling, uh, sorry, up to the roof, making your roof fatter um, so it's more controlled, and then using the convection in the space, uh, which again Griff mentioned as well. Um, using the convection in the space is really good, and particularly in Adelaide, um, pretty much all the examples that I see where we've kind of raked a roof, um, had some high level windows up there to purge the heat out. Um, it's a really easy way of actually um, getting that building to work passively before you actually have to intervene, put a split system on or, or the like. Um, it's actually really good to see that the, the software is actually changing and soon we're actually going to have um, is essentially a version of the NetHair software that um, is more a whole house. So it's going to actually include things like water as well, which is fantastic. Um, but currently, we can only really do floor and wall constructions. We can put in a, an insulation value for the roof, but it's not necessarily as specific as what we would like. Uh, we know, and looking at these images, that um, essentially above this layer of um, what is OSB board, but it's actually like a chipboard. Um, so above our airtight layer, we've got different layers in there that are actually affecting the performance in the building. We'd like to be able to model that. Um, so that's definitely something that we're, uh, you know, in, in instructing the government that we would like to see in future iterations of that software. Um, downlights, most people would be across this now, but it is still modelled in the software because there is still a, a notion that there's some sort of displacement happening of insulation. Um, should you put things like downlights, fans, and then, you know, the, the cap might go across it, but it might still displace the insulation a little bit. Uh, flues and penetrations uh, in that as well. Um, and then because of monitoring that is on the house, we're, we're trying to essentially um, put, put the case and we'd, we'd really love um, all of these wonderful 380 people watching today, um, really love your feedback and your, your push with us um, as a larger voice to actually get um, Australian houses below at least five air changes. Um, generally, it's below seven air changes in Adelaide. I'm not quite sure what the other states are doing, but um, the, the construction types here seem to be fairly airtight, uh, but we want to see that driven down further. And then as soon as we get into places that are um, not only houses, um, aged care and education, um, as soon as we get closer to those places, I'd really, really love to see us getting down into below three air changes per hour and having fresh air brought in. Um, and the reason we would love to see that happen is actually really good for your brains. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk out there because of COVID currently, fresh air supply, so forth. Um, there's a lot of people in lockdown. Um, and the amount of um, carbon dioxide that's being built in the home or the amount of time that people are in their homes while things are off-gassing um, and, you know, penetrating gases into the environment around you, um, the less healthy it becomes. So we really want to see that variable added. Um, so the more, more pressure you can put on your builders, the better. Uh, reef insulation construction, I've, I've touched on that. We need more specific constructions in these softwares. Um, automation is a big one. So automation on this particular house and uh, on the eight star house next door was included, uh, not only so you get the monitoring out, but because generally a lot of the um, predicted analysis that you do on buildings are really unrealistic for whoever's in the house. If there's some sort of automation or if we can actually program how people are actually gonna use their homes, 
um, in a way that's a little bit more realistic or it might not just be a generic four person home, we might be able to put an option in there for another person. Um, that would be fantastic because the property is not only the space, the air, uh, the construction, it all changes um, depending on how many people you have in that space. Um, and then obviously um, solar would be another great thing to put on there so that we can automatically calculate at that front end um, exactly how much energy you're going to use and how much you could actually offset elsewhere. Um, so you can see the construction example uh, here as well. So this is essentially our ceiling in this house. Um, and this is a common methodology that we use a lot of uh, in a lot of houses as well, where you actually got the services running through a service cavity. Uh, it's been done in Europe for, you know, 15 years or something. So it's not something new, but it is a little bit more new for the, the builders here, particularly in Adelaide. Um, I believe the Eastern States might be a little bit further <laughs> advanced than what we are, but um, essentially it will bring the airtight layer of the house. So what is actually keeping the house from leaking, um, it'll actually bring that through the ceiling and then come all the way to the wall. So you can actually see that the chipboard runs past that brickwork. The brickwork actually stops before that service cavity. And then you can actually see a tiny bit of blue around the window, uh, which is essentially all of our airtight layer that's behind that brick wall um, actually taped together. So you've got this nice sort of red line around where people can and can't build or put, you know, screwdrivers through and things. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, this, this image down the bottom is just um, showing essentially the HIV pipes. It's not too dissimilar from having normal ducting. Um, there are different alternatives out there at the moment that are being developed by uh, companies. Um, this is a stable system, stable Eltron. Um, but the ducts are only sort of around about 125 millimetres, so fairly small, which is great. Um, they can fit in just about anywhere. And the only tiny little things that you see uh, here, they don't actually show the caps on, but um, essentially these were cut down and you've just got this tiny little metal grate uh, on the wall instead of having something like a split system, which would then create more dust and not bring in the fresh air as well. Um, so the advantage of these systems is they regulate not only the indoor air for its quality, but the, the humidity in particular, so that the construction doesn't start um, sweating. Um, and when, or if there was a case where it did start sweating inside the building, or say in the instance of this house, if we have too many people inside the building, um, that there's a way, way for it to actually come out of the building and not be contained in there. So the problem that you get is when um, essentially there is a trap of humidity or moisture, either in the construction uh, or in plasterboards uh, or within those cavities, the first little um, layers inside of your wall and it can't actually be extracted from the house. Um, so normally that would be with uh, cooking or showering. Um, I noticed the humidity sensors went up quite a bit, as did the CO2 when we had the opening of the house as well, uh, because we probably had about 40 people in this tiny space, um, which was, we, we just timed it right because of the COVID restrictions. But um, you can see that the house does use a lot of the passive principles that Griff was talking about. I won't touch on them too much because um, he's gone through them in quite a bit of depth, but we've done something very similar. So we've, um, we've fortunately had a block that faced for the majority north. It was just very slightly off, um, but we've essentially used quite a high level of thermal mass inside of the building with the concrete floor and reverse brick veneer through most of the house. Um, that has actually let us control the temperatures of the building quite passively. And then we introduced the HRV in there and it actually starts pulling and pushing that air around the building inside uh, so that the whole of the house is a little bit more even in temperature as well. Um, and then also, uh, I think it was Griff potentially also touched on um, the levels of shading. So again, I won't go too much into that because he has, but um, this is another example maybe of what he was talking about. We've done the same thing. Um, we don't generally oversize ease. Um, in some cases, we'll keep them about 450, but what we do work on is layering of shade and uh, the opportunity to either control it seasonally or um, by having blinds plus an eve or smallish eve 
um, plus this open fixed structure, which is actually going to have some deciduous vines on it as well. Um, and that way we can really start cooling down the space. Um, and also because you can tell that this block was tiny, uh, it was about 10 meters across. So the building itself is probably, you know, probably eight and a half meters um, at its deepest point. Um, so it doesn't actually have a whole lot of space around the building and it's quite important to actually have the airflow around the building as well. Um, so we've done that here. Um, I'll just shoot through a little bit quicker, but um, the other thing that we do is we try to control where the actual penetrations come inside of the building. So um, both Griff and Jury talked about different construction methods um, and how to get your building to work passively. But once you've got it work, working passively, you've got to contain that in there. Um, services like, uh, like laundry taps and things that actually go straight through the wall, um, they can actually leak quite a bit. And also, uh, if you take a thermal camera three, you'll actually see these giant rings of heat or cool that are actually coming through those spaces, through the cavity of your wall. Um, we've done tests where it could be, you know, two, three metres away from the actual source on the outside of the building, but it's actually coming in that far and leaking inside of your building. Um, so here in the left, we've actually brought it through the slab. The slab is completely sealed. We've also opted for no... Um, additional laundry. We've actually done a European laundry um, and the brains of the building is essentially tucked in here as well. So it's um, essentially the nervous system and it's got all the wiring, uh, all the sensors um, come back to this point and it's a way of us, us controlling um, how this building can actually be adapted. So we can get anyone um, moving into this building or the eight star building on the right screen there um, and not affect the performance of the building too much because We've actually put that air tightness layer quite far back in the construction of that wall or roof. Um, so people can still adapt to the construction and, and, and make it their own, essentially. Um, you'll see also um, the eight star, and I've put a little note on the right there, but in case you don't want to read it, um, essentially because we've put it to 8.2 stars and we're, we're like, oh, you know, we, we don't really need to bring it up near 10 or even nine and a half stars. What we wanted to test out was, um, the use of hydronic heating in this particular case because it's got very, very little north light. Um, and so we've used an internal courtyard and specific um, daylighting in certain areas to actually bring that light in. And then the hydronic heating, because it's throughout the whole of the house, plus the HRV, actually kind of balance the house out um, by itself anyway. Um, and it, uh, I've actually walked in there recently with the new owners and it's, it's quite comfortable, even though we have had some quite cold days in Adelaide. Um, again, we use convection uh, in spaces, so the rake ceilings, um, Griff um, touched on that, I think, as well. Um, and where we don't have the opportunity for north light, we don't just rely on the basic building codes to say what our ventilation and lighting should be. Um, which, you know, if it's 5%, might only be a window this size. That's it's not going to be a nice room to be in. So we use things like top lighting uh, and then using the centre of that building or the centre of that room, should I say, to actually bring the, the air up through the top. Um, so it can actually be purged out um, quite, quite nicely. And, you know, who, who wouldn't be fussed about laying in a bed looking up at the, the sky anyway? So... Um, this is just a quick plan of the space. Um, so this is actually a boundary wall between the 8.2 star house and the 10 star house. Um, so we've had to shape the courtyard to get a, the maximum amount of light into that area. And we've also switched up the floor materials in this case because we didn't have enough north lighting, there wasn't any use putting an exposed concrete slab. So we've actually uh, insulated the slab and the slab edge and then uh, put the hydronic heating in and change the materials on the top layer of the concrete. Um, again, uh, Griff has also touched on that. Hey, Ruth, we're running yep. over time. It'd be great to um, wrap up when wrap you up. can, if it's possible. Thank you. No worries. Um, so these, these are just um, the membranes and the insulation going into those spaces um, and the air tightness layer uh, would be sitting inside of these. So this is before the air tightness layer goes on the inside of the wall, but it's weatherproof and vapor permeable on the outside. Um, and then comparing how the buildings perform between the six and the 10 stars. So this graph here essentially shows the outside temperature during cold week and winter. 
um, and then what essentially a 10 star does. And this is what a, a six star does, the red line there. So it's quite dramatically different and fluctuates quite a bit. Um, hot week in particularly Adelaide is, is even more dramatic away from that equilibrium. And um, you get some really extreme hot days. Um, and if you're not controlling the amount of humidity that's inside the um, houses, then they could get quite sweaty as well. Um, so I'll make this available as well, but um, essentially what we've tried to do on this is bring in some of those international standards. So it's, it's mimicking some of the passive house air tightness. Um, and then we've also um, compared that to essentially what the CSIRO have published about air tightness and um, insulation. Um, but if you look at uh, what passive house does in, in particular regarding air tightness um, is actually about 5% of what current houses do. So it's quite tight um, and, you know, and, and works essentially. Um, the other thing that we'd like to see people start doing is monitoring their um, appliances and so forth inside. Um, you can see here, someone's left the lights on in the 10 star home. We had a lot of um, events around that time as well, and it was used quite a lot. Um, so we can actually see little um, abnormalities in programming and monitoring on houses by putting some of these um, very cheap devices in, in houses as well. Um, again, comfort level. So uh, this is the max outdoor, uh, quite lumpy, quite hot, get up, gets up to just below 40 degrees on that particular February day. Uh, inside was quite warm as well, but the house itself remains quite stable throughout the whole time. Um, and this is um, another one I wanted to show you. So this peak is actually um, essentially a home that's shut up partially, but it's got a lot of people in. So we had the opening plus also all the cleaning um, on those days and then the CO2 level um, skyrocketed on those two days as well. Um, someone was um, in the chat earlier talking about ratios. So essentially using Hubble and these ratios of facing north, south, west, east, um, just on a generic plan, I've given you an idea of um, using that particular ratio on a, a small block, what the star rating would be, um, using the construction. So a reverse brick veneer home currently gets about 8.1 stars in Adelaide. Um, be very generic construction. Um, the only thing that's maybe a little bit more expensive uh, in this case is the windows. Um, so again, this comes down to kind of proving a point to the government and, and so forth that it doesn't necessarily cost too much more to make it um, well designed. It's to do with where your windows are facing and orientation. Um, same with the fibre cement home, still up at 7.88 with generic constructions. Um, but where the star rating really fails um, and is starting to show that um, is, uh, you know, there's, there's other things that are not going quite right in that ha house, in particular, um, the bridging through the frame from the outside to the in, um, it actually drops the star rating down quite a bit as well. But again, um, I'll make this available for you. Um, it's also worth for your own um, education, I guess, having a look at the actions for zero carbon buildings and see if the builders that you're going to um, are actually starting to look for these things in their, you know, off the plan houses and so forth or, or little portable buildings because it's really important that we actually start getting some of these, um, you know, checklists off um, so that we can actually reduce the demand at the site and not have to bring in more energy and then, you know, maybe have a little bit surplus that you can give back to the grid as well. Um, Ruth, is it okay if we can um, take some of, are you almost there or we can yeah, we take that, some that. more questions um, from the audience and then move to the panel discussion? Is that? Yep, yeah, yeah that's fine. That was the last one, so. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, we'll finish off. I'm not trying to interrupt. No, someone. that's okay. Yeah, There's probably. so many questions. I can see that people are dying to, to have the panel discussion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, there's quite good questions coming through. Um, yeah, oh, they're so, amazing. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm very impressed at um, people researching, which is good. Um, high performance, poor performance. Again, um, I'll make this PDF available. I, I don't know um, if there's a means that we can do that through the chat, but if not, you can email us. 
um, air tightness is one and um, also means that the construction will last a lot longer. Um, so we try to focus on reducing the amount of construction waste as well, not only during construction, but uh, rebuilds down the track, which again touch on, touches on Jerry's um, you know, adaptation um, theory as well. Um, and there's just you know some um, takeaway um, dot points for you in terms of what each of these particular aspects um, do or do not to the construction um, and, and how to really improve your building. And I really try to um, give homeowners as much information as possible uh, or checklists and things so that they can actually interrogate their builders and you know see where they can improve. Um, and I really like sites and, and working with builders that actually want to have that um, two-way communication on site with the client there, plus, you know, maybe us so that we can actually troubleshoot it together. And then that way the, the owners also know how to operate the house uh, in their own time as well, which is very important. So I'll leave it there. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's brilliant. And we actually are going to hear from some homeowners now as well as part of this event. And so um, we are talking about designing for sustainability and we've heard from three incredible presenters tonight and uh, if you can all pop your, your cameras on, uh, we'll start to have our panel discussion uh, and I also want to bring into the conversation uh, uh, Rob and Rita Phillips, uh, they have an established passive solar house in rural Wanneroo in WA and Andy Lehman who uh, has a fibro cottage deep energy retrofit in New South Wales and also in New South Wales, um, Sarah Laney, who is with One Tree Hill. And you can find all of their house profiles uh, on the Sustainable House Day website. They each have incredible stories to tell. And we are running a little bit behind time, but if you um, have your, like, your, your 30 second pitch, each of you, to, to tell us a little bit about your house so that people um, know where you're coming from when, when you participate in the questions, maybe we can start with you, Rob or Rita. Yeah. yeah. Um, g'day. Um, we've um, been living in this house for 30 years. Uh, we built it pretty much according to Griff's specifications. Um, you can see behind us um, the grapevines are just starting to come out with the, um, the spring, so we'll have a nice shade over the north side of our house very soon. Um, like Yuri, um, we, the room we're in at the moment was our workshop for um, at least five years while we built the other bits of the house and then afforded a shed and stuff like that. Um, I might just leave it at that. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And now. Andy, a little intro from you. Yeah, hi. Um, Andy LeMann is my name and uh, I'm in Mittagong in New South Wales. And uh, I actually have two houses in the um, Sustainable House Day this year. One is called the Greeny Flat, which is in its uh, seventh year in the uh, Sustainable House Day. And then this year we've just finished uh, what you described as a, a deep energy retrofit on the old fibro cottage that was that was originally on the property that where we built the Greeny Flat. So we've upgraded it to now it's um, energy positive as well. So um, both of those are our um, profiles are on the Sustainable House Day website. Thanks so much. I love this um, theme of iterative um, design as well. It's, it's fantastic. And Sarah, um, the intro from you. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Sarah Leaney. I live in Braidwood in uh, New South Wales, about 100 kilometres from Canberra. Um, and for me, uh, I had lived all my life in houses that were um, leaky and drafty, um, oriented the wrong way, wrong windows, rooms in the wrong areas. Um, and I'd been paying a lot for power bills and water bills. So I had the opportunity to build this house um, where I could hopefully change all those things um, and make it the perfect house for me. And that's what I've done. Thanks so much. And look, why don't we just stick with you and then perhaps others will have uh, answers as well. Um, but we heard earlier um, also from Ruth um, talking about the investment upfront in order to, to save on running costs later. And that's like a hot topic, particularly around the National Construction Code. Um, I mean, what was your, you know, what was your sweet spot, Sarah? And I'd, I'd love Ruth and others to, to answer this as well for how much you do invest in the upfront um, sustainable build to yeah. also to, 
well one comfort but also to, to save on energy bills and, yeah. and everything yeah. else later uh, it was a bit of a challenge for me um it's a bit of a game trying to um reduce my my power costs and water costs as much as I could um, and I knew that I was paying a lot up front uh, and it was a more expensive build than a regular build but it wasn't for me it wasn't just see how much money I could save but it was knowing that I would be using a lot fewer uh, resources to run the house so from an environmental um, point of view that was part of of my aim um, yeah yeah, and are you going to jump in there, Ruth? Go for it. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's it's a funny topic because um, we deal with we builders, architects, designers, homeowners, um, government, um, and it, it seems like there's one one group in that area that doesn't quite get that you can actually um, increase the performance of the house for not too much extra cost. I think the passive house stat is something like five percent. You know extra in terms of the construction cost to input it but then they have the return on the investment within you know five ten years which is much the same as doing a solar panel um so it's it's really interesting um, when we get clients in um and they're open to doing things like parts of the house like jerry was saying parts of the house first and then adapting then they can really control the energy use at that first point um, you know if they're coming out of a rental I, I rent and we had like a $1,500 um, energy bill per quarter when I had my babies you know because the heaters were on so trying to reduce the energy bills by um, you know insulating the house well to start off with making it size wise um, and then adapting later gives people more empowerment to do more in the long term i think um and as i said the less health impact the better yeah there was a real yeah. health theme running through all the presentations as well um andy then rob or rita i'm not sure which put your hand up um, andy first yeah just on the point of affordability um i uh when people ask me how do you afford the the extra cost of you know the insulation the double glazing and things like that my first thing answer is build a smaller house. You know, we build the biggest houses in the world in Australia and there's no need for that. So start smaller and then you, then you can afford to, to um, build at a higher quality. Yeah. Can I just jump in there? Um, when we built our house 30 years ago, we basically built it just according to normal, whatever, if we're in Perth in Western Australia, just according to what the normal house building rules were, it was double brick, tin roof, brick walls on the inside, but we just built it according to what Griff was saying, the, the passive solar design with the airflow through the south, southwest to northeast, blowing through the, the, the house and having the grapevine to have shade in winter. And yeah, we had very low, it was yeah, basically, basically, was basically no extra cost on building a normal house. It was just the, the orientation, et cetera, um, except we wish we could have had um, double glazed windows or something like But but Which we, we 30 just, years ago was not really available here. True, things change and evolve, thankfully. Uh, talking about change and, and evolution, uh, there, uh, Kevin put a question in the Q&A asking about additional consideration for ventilation and air exchange particularly around COVID. And I think we are becoming a bit smarter and a bit more onto it when it comes to, to air exchange because, because of the pandemic. But um, you might have been into it for a, a, a long time. Um, I wonder, oh, you've got your hand up, Yuri. I don't know if it's about the, the other question, but perhaps we can throw one around air tightness to you. Uh, are you seeing things change or uh, improve with around the pandemic with our understanding of of um, ventilation and, and any additional considerations that we should be um, bringing into our house design? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Like, you know, I work in New South Wales and Tassie and mostly in Tassie, but also in New South Wales, in Australia, there's this huge issue with the condensation in, in houses. And, you know, every second rental, you will see a small issues on the ceiling and the bathroom, kitchen and everywhere else, you know, walking, walk, uh, not walking, you know, building robes often are covered in mold inside, you know, in our rentals <clears throat> in New South Wales, you know. Um, <clears throat> I think this, yeah, it's, it's really strange how, I mean, Australian houses were, are not really drafty and now the, the, the golden standard seems to be to live in a, you know, closed jar. 
so quite the opposite. Um, like where I come from, European background, you know, Czech Republic, relatively cold climate, colder than Tasmania. Uh, my wife is Russian, you know, they have minus 40 in winter where she's from. And uh, even in these conditions, at least once a week, the whole house or apartment is completely open. All the windows are open and it's considered part of good hygiene and your, you know, Saturday cleanup. Part of it is total air exchange and the whole house is left uh, completely open for you know, 30, 40 minutes, an hour. Um, yeah, you may be a little cold, you know, for that amount of time, but it's kind of considered healthy and it is healthy. And um, I remember from my childhood, this was justified not by condensation, that just was a non-issue because this happened so often. So condensation wasn't a big trouble for us. Um, but uh, it was justified as just a healthy thing to do, you know, like um, to get rid of all the bacteria and sort of airborne um, uh, pathogens. Um, and it, it probably should be done once a day, you know, I, I consider it a good thing to do once a day to just air out the house. And a lot of the problems we have in, in Tassie and you know, elsewhere in Australia right now is in the condensation, this would be resolved, you know, like I've been in a position of uh, a landlord uh, once yeah, in the past. Um, and uh, I know that my tenants had big problems with, uh, with mold and they sort of tried to, you know, to make me to sort of rectify it by repainting the ceiling or some of my clients have dealt with mold like that and it just doesn't work and um, you can do anything you want technologically within the wall structure um, introduce seven nine ten different layers in the building code that are required um, but if you don't yeah air the house out um, I mean it's that's your first port of call and oftentimes the only one you need to open up the house once a day it's part of the passive solar design and uh, uh, to actually open the house at night or in daytime, depending on the time of the year and conditions outside. Um, and in a the passive house, the German standard that is more popular in Australia now, you have this constant forced ventilation with a heat exchanger. So that addresses that issue a little bit as well. You need to open your house up once a day for a while. <laughs> and um, I, I can see you've got your hand up there, Ruth, and other a, a few questions have come through about sweating, a building sweating too. So you might want to touch on that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't type and then listen at the same time because my keyboard is so low. So I apologise for not replying to it. Yeah, um, so I, I've got quite a big interest um, in Australia not making mistakes that we've seen overseas. So someone's popped in there about New Zealand. So New Zealand's issues from my understanding from fellow colleagues over there um, shortly came after reconstruction, after a extreme event. Um, I think it was an earthquake or something over there. And so they started building these tighter homes and then they started sweating. And now, you know, it's five, 10 years down the track. They're actually having to go in and demolish those and rectify them. Um, and as Jerry said, it's not just a matter of painting over mould or doing things like that. You've actually got to ventilate out the space. And I think in some ways, um, well, at least, you know, between between maybe when I grew up and, and where I am now in my career, um, you know, the last 15 years or so, um, people have kind of forgotten about how to open windows almost. Um, and so they just rely on putting on a split system or, or something like that. And it's not actually increasing the air quality inside of the house or getting rid of the condensation. Um, so it's really important that we do that here. There's some issues with the bushfire construction because bushfire construction is actually built really tight as well. Um, so those sorts of instances, we've got to start looking at the vapor permeable membranes on the outside or little control layers within the wall to actually stop the condensation happening. Um, Thank you so, so much. And there, right. I mean, there's so many questions in the Q&A well, question. coming if you can. <laughs> yeah. um, there's one around um, here and, and perhaps we can throw this to, to yeah. group to start with around heating. Um, Leslie and Phil have both asked about heating particularly following Yuri's presentation, because um, you're speaking about a building in Tassie. Um, yeah, anything you have to say about heating and, and passive solar design, Griff? Um, look, heating and passive solar design, if you get the combination, as I think I mentioned in there, and I answered a couple of questions, a difficult one to answer in regard to your glazing to mass to volume of air uh, ratios, because you change those. so. Once, from a heating point of view, you can get very, very stable temperatures, which allows you to open a home up in the middle of winter, say for an hour in the middle of a winter's day, 
And once you close it up, once you get rid of the moisture in the building, you get rid of the stale air, then that allows you to return to your normal temperature within about 15 minutes, the temperature that was when you before you opened the building. Um, heating the building up, uh, in, down in Tassie, it depends. You change your glazing ratios to mass and the depth of room. So in other words, there was another question about, oh, I've, I've, my backyard, I'm going to put a granny flat in, it'll be seven metres. Well, if it was in Tassie, I might make it six metres deep so I can get more penetration into the house and I'd change my mass ratios to glazing ratios. And it depends on where I was, whether it was in Launceston, whether it was in Hobart or whether it was someone else, somewhere else. So it's very specific to the area. And as I say, even at the bottom of the hill or the top of the hill, all of that could change. But again, you can generally, even in Tassie, I think I've done two houses in Tassie, and you can generally keep them around about 19 to 20 degrees through the whole of winter. Your issue is where you have large cloudy periods where you'd need heating. And if you do, the best form of heating is radiant heating. So therefore, look, um, again, if you can store some heat and use radiant panels from a solar point of view, a small pellet heater doesn't give you much radiant heat, but it's very, very efficient from using a solid fuel source. A lot of Tassies still use uh, solid fuel in burners, which is a good heating source, but it has a high pollution content. So radiant heat is always the best in an open space. And also radiant heat will go penetrate into mass, our mass and the building mass and hold it. Whereas convective heat from an air conditioning system or some air transfer mechanism is very slow to transfer into the mass of the building. So you don't hold that for a long period of time. Does that help? I can't answer for the, the question now, but if anyone else has anything to add, please please jump in. Oh, maybe I will just say it's it's a fine balancing act. Like I agree with um, with grief, but you know with the gist of it, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's things. It's even things like how often are you in the house? Are you in the house every day, all day, or do you travel a lot? Do you come back to your home once a week? Or, um, with the radiant heating, yeah, it's very, very efficient. Uh, if if you have a little radiant uh, heater next to, say, your typically your office desk, let's say, so you're sitting right next to it, and it really warms you up. Um, can't imagine, you know, heating, say, a thermal mass, um, heating it with a, you know, electrically powered radiant heater may not be the the best thing. I guess it's, it's, it's also balancing it between the cost and economy of materials. So like. Uh, if you build a, a passive solar design designed home in Tasmania, you will have to have your floor slab insulated from from the ground. It requires a lot of plastic and possibly quite a lot of earthwork. Um, sometimes you can't have a concrete slab at all because of the side um, topo uh, graphene. You know, so as um, it is a fun balancing act. I don't think there's like one easy answer to to all of this. Um, really good and interesting um, source of heating and cooling is, uh, is a geothermal, so uh, hydraulic or, uh, or, or um, you know, air filled pipes going quite deep under your house and either the air or the liquid is forced through it and through a simple solar pump, it can only operate in daytime and then you store the heat or, you know, in the house or in the ground, depending where, where you're based. So, so geothermal heating is, you know, pretty, pretty efficient. Um, next to the solar passive. And so, I mean, it's, I think it, the issue is way too complex. I wouldn't probably <laughs> recommend against or for any one of these, uh, these methods. It's a fine balancing act. Well, Robin Re or Rita about to jump in. Yeah, just to say that with the typical passive solar house, the curtains are really important in keeping heat in. So we have pelmets above our windows. We have double thickness curtains. And you know, at this time of day, as the sun's going down in winter, we close the curtains and keep the cold out at night and open them up in the morning to let the sun in. If you don't do that, which happened when we were away once and our sun and 
Rita's sister were staying in our house and they were both too busy to do the curtains, the house just froze. They were, they were just so cold all the time because they didn't close or open the curtains at the right time. So it's a simple thing to do and you can, you know, keep a house very comfortable just with the curtains. And in summer, you do the opposite. You close the curtains during the hottest part of the day and you open them in the evening when the, the breeze, the Fremantle doctor comes along and blows the breeze. You open the curtains, open the windows, cool the house down. And it works exactly the opposite of what you do in winter. And it works really, really well. Okay, um, was anyone else wanting to add or we can go to another question? Um, I was just gonna say how wonderful it is hearing homeowners say that because that's half of the, you know, the challenge in design is getting people to learn how to open their homes. But, and, and what is so important about Renew and Sanctuary and the work that you guys do is it's, is directed to homeowner level so they can be engaged to learn how to operate the house, do what Jerry said, you know, ventilate the house, open and close the curtains. Um, it's surprising how many builders actually don't put the curtains into a house, um, although it's required in the energy rating. Um, a lot of owners don't know that. So it's, yeah, heads up. Well done. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add a useful analogy like living in a, living in a, Sustainable house, sustainably is much like uh, sailing a boat or sailing a ship. You know, you have to open that door, you have to draw that curtain. Uh, yeah, he was constantly sort of on top of what is happening. So it is very much like sailing. And I, um, there's a few question coming, questions coming in around constraints. And I know some really, you know, fascinating uh, solutions can come when you've got a site with constraints. And it'd be great to hear from from Sarah and Andy on this, because we haven't heard from you for a while. Um, Ali was asking, they have a, an existing garden they're trying to build in and it would allow a house to be about seven meters wide. And they're pondering how they could have a house two, two rooms deep with this kind of depth. And I, I guess without trying to solve their particular problem, how have you gone about dealing with site constraints uh, in, in your circumstances? Um, I, I think my problem was um, even harder because the town I live in is um, a New South Wales state government heritage town. So it had an additional layer of constraints um, over and above what the council uh, said I could do and couldn't do. So, I mean, things like you can't build more than one storey, you have to have um, uh, a a gable roof, you can't have a skillion roof, which I wanted in the first place. So there were lots of constraints that I had to work around. And one of the important things that I did that I'm advising everyone in our area to do, um, while I was in the stage of uh, designing the house, I actually met with the heritage officer um, and with the council to say, this is what I plan to do, is this gonna get through? Um, which meant that we did um, refine the design a little bit, uh, and when it went to council to be approved, it, uh, I think there were a couple of very minor amendments we had to make, but other than that, it could have been really expensive um, to keep going back and forth to council um, to try and fit in with their constraints. So it, for me, it did depend on knowing beforehand what the constraints were going to be. I know that's not really the site um, constraints that you're talking about, but um, that was just the additional layer of constraints that we had here. Yeah, interesting. We we also had uh, we're also in a heritage conservation area here, so that was another one of our constraints. Um, the I suppose the main thing for us, the site that that where where the old fibro cottage was and where we built the greenie flat is uh, is pretty much a perfect site for a passive solar house. And so with the greenie flat, the the main thing we had to do was not mess it up. Because you know it's quite possible to, if you do the wrong thing, to to ruin a really good site. Um, you know, in the example of that you asked about the, I think it was a woman who said she, the site constraint uh, limits her to seven meters wide. Well, if that's actually depending on where she is and the climate she's in, uh, in for our area, seven meters is actually a really good depth for a house if it's if it's uh, if you can have it running long in the east-west direction and only seven metres deep in the north-south direction, that means that you get really, really good um, 
solar penetration in the winter time. Um, and I think Griff touched on that before um, talking about a house in Tasmania where you might choose to only have it six meters deep. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, the, the, the really big constraint we had with the fiber cottage retrofit was that the house was already here um, and it wasn't designed as a passive solar house. And so we had to um, play a few tricks basically to try to get it as, uh, to perform as close as we could to an ideal passive solar design. Thanks, was there anyone else wanted to add around constraints? Um, there's lots of questions also around materials, uh, you know, what balancing between timber versus aluminium and windows and, and so forth. Uh, oh, Griff, you've got your hand up. Uh, you could build on the question before, or we can, you know, maybe build um, into well, the look, I, I, can, I can do both. Look, when it comes okay. to, um, you know, constriction on a site, um, there was one question I noticed in there where people are talking about where you've got a, um, infill or you've got uh, a lot of two-story houses around each other. Uh, we have that all the time. We might have the living areas upstairs. And what we do is we use opaque glass up to 1.6 metres because overlooking is an issue. Um, so therefore we'll still get full sun into that area upstairs. And then it's critical to use the upper floor as your main airflow to create a venturi effect as well as a stacking effect to get your airflow through the lower floor because airflow is a, a trouble when you have buildings um, very close to each other. You can use trombi walls where you can't have a window facing an area. Um, people can look it up, T-R-O-M-B-E, a French guy who designed them. You can do half trombi walls, full trombi walls where you're using a mass wall with glass on the outside to heat the wall up as a convective device as well as a, a, a mass radiant device. And just, you need to look that up. When it comes to building materials, it's really a combination. How you, how you separate the mass. I mean, Ruth was talking about, you know, passive solar and passive house together, which is an ideal combination um, when you can do it, where you've got the mass isolated from, you know, uh, you know, well insulated external and the materials don't matter as long as you look at every component part and they all fit together to give you the overall performance. So it's just so many different materials could be used What's cost effective? What is um, the not just cost effective, but low carbon? What can be reused? What can be recycled? We did a Sibiaco demonstration home years ago and we pulverized the building on site, put it back together as rammed mass with some fines in it to reuse the tiles, the glass, all the bricks in the building back into the mass into a new two story building. So there's lots of things you can do. It's just how creative are you? Yuri, were you going to say something as well? Um, I, I think Griff just uh, mentioned the trombi wall. I'm not sure about the name, but it is the solar wall. I'm assuming that sort of, yeah, it can yeah, can stand. You know, even in a separate building, it can kind of, if your house is shaded, you can have a have something offset. You know, two three meters, and basically, um, yeah, through ducts you can convect um, air that you basically trap in the form of a glass house um, inside a thermal mass block. Which can and that just brings me to an idea. It, it, uh, your your compost heap, if you have a compost heap, generates an incredible amount of heat. Um, you know, people have um, uh, put um, plastic or other piping through a compo uh, compost heap, and he, he would be surprised how, how how much heat heat you get out of that. So, I mean, um, um, pool of creativity is uh, bottomless, really. Yeah, it's interesting that. Um... Uh, you just said about the passive house and passive solar and combining the principles. Do you find that people need to fully understand these different approaches to buildings in order to be able to make these decisions? I mean, how do, how do, you, how do we keep, get people up to speed with the level of knowledge they need to then make the, the decision that's right for them? And again, the hands go up before I finish my question, maybe Andy and Ruth, I don't know if you're answering that question or what, the previous one. Uh, yeah, well, I, I put my hand up for this one. Um, uh, I, um, I, I taught, taught passive solar design in, in Montana for a while, and I, I sort of break passive solar design up into 10 simple steps, and they're all, they are all very simple common sense things. 
But the, the key to it is that it, you have to take a holistic approach to it. You can do nine of them right and one of them wrong and you can, and you can mess up the whole thing. Um, so there, there is a, does require a certain amount of education because I've seen a lot of projects where people got half the information and did a half a passive solar house, but faced it the wrong direction, say, or faced it west, for example, and just created a solar oven in the summertime. Um, or there's other things you can do, you know, plant the wrong kind of tree in the wrong place. And 20 years from, from now, you might have no sun coming into the house at all. So I do think that um, it's, uh, it's important for people to understand the whole, the whole picture in order to get it right. Henry? <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually agree. And that um, that actually was quite a, a great description because um, in, in our case for the 10 star home and the ones up there, it was based on orientation and the limits on the size, why that we brought in so much of the passive house principles. It wasn't just because we couldn't, um, you know, change the, the form per se. Um, if, if we already have a site where we have more opportunity for solar passive, of course, we're going to use that first because it's the cheaper option. Um, so driving down demand for other goods to come to site or construction as well. Um, but the passive house principles we use quite a lot, um, especially if we have clients that have um, allergies or if there's risk of the materials actually um, sweating. I know there's a lot of questions about sweating, <laughs> but essentially um, it, it means that we can control that environment for them. So if someone doesn't need a controlled environment, they might not need passive principles, but it's got to be based on context for that site. So it's, it's like laying out a, you know, a giant monopoly board and saying you want certain parts of the whole board or you do want little little parts or you're happy with your little green blocks all in a row so you know take a little little or as much as you need uh, we'll also advise parts that we think they should consider but ultimately it's going to be up to them and then they can include them later as well and we're actually right on eight o'clock so if you need to leave we understand we will this is built at finishing at eight o'clock but we will ask another a question to the panel um, because i feel like you know, there's, there's quite a few questions there in the Q&A we haven't got to yet. Um, Tim asks uh, that after airtight and insulation considerations, would it be more cost effective to place a very large solar array to utilise free solar energy rather than trust that a passive house can be built that will perform in a very hot, very cold situation at an economical cost? I guess for me, I interpret that about, you know, at, at what point do we rely on technology? To, to help us here and to achieve our sustainability goals. Um, I don't know if each of you might have a response to that, how perhaps you, you've used technology in this way. Yeah, I think that came up when I was talking about the different elements um, on that particular design. But um, yeah, essentially, if, if we're looking to kit like uh, the architects declare you know, checklist, we're trying to aim for the 2030 goals. We've got to start to produce the demand on site first before you put solar panels on there, um, because otherwise the solar panels are just, again, like a Band-Aid remedy for that site. Um, we're not going to reduce emissions if we don't produce the demand first on site. So trying to limit, um, you know, the the solar panel lifespan or inclusion of batteries uh, or any of these other different construction processes which require more trades to come to site, uh, more labour, more materials, more waste um, is always going to be the best approach. I might add to that. Great, um, thanks Yuri. Keep going. Yeah, sorry, if it's okay. Yeah, uh, it's, look again, it's, it's a balance, you know, so uh, the solar solar passive design and similar approaches is is, is, a, is, a, is the ex excellent start. Like you first reduce the demand, but then you always need a backup. And um, you know, you have heat waves and you have cold spells and so on. So, so surely some some solar panel um, array would be always useful. Um, alternatively, you can always subscribe for 100% green power. I'm not sure why everyone isn't on it. It's not that much more expensive than regular electricity. Um, 
And oftentimes it's, uh, I mean, you know, in, in some sort of urban setting and so on, it's probably more economical and, um, uh, and you're not dealing with uh, re replacing your solar panels every so often and maintaining them and so on. So the 100% solar green power, you know, grid to solar systems, uh, batteries as such, they have a limited life and unfortunately they result in quite a lot of environmental pollution end of life. Only very small, percent, small percentage is actually recycled despite um, or despite uh, what, what more, most people believe, I guess. Um, so they do end up in landfill. Um, I like recently I hear more and more often from solar installers that um, people no, no longer uh, require so much of actual hot, uh, solar hot water systems. They use uh, traditional cheap uh, storage uh, electric hot water units as batteries really. So they you know have five kilowatt solar panels on the roof, which costs five to 10,000 these days, depending what grade you get. Um, and instead of having batteries, they store their electricity, their grid tied solar system electricity um, in the, they store the power in or the energy in the hot water, or uh, possibly they can store it in a, in a storage electric heaters and then releasing the heat later in the night. So, I mean, it's part of this kind of balance, yeah. Yeah, could I come in there too, Carl? Yeah, and, okay. and, and I was going to say almost all the things that Yuri said. Well, I was going to say all those things, so I agree with you. Um, and we're planning to do all those sort of things. I guess what I'd add is that um, in a year or two in Western Australia, at least, we'll be able to have a, a buy an electric vehicle, government um, making the prices cheaper, um, hopefully. Um, but then use that electric vehicle to charge it during the day from our solar array and use its um, the battery um, during this time of day to um, avoid us taking power off the grid. So to, to smooth out demand. And if no one else has anything to add, we are at time. It's uh, after eight o'clock and we are at the end of this, the very first expert session as part of this year's Sustainable House Day. Uh, thank you to each of you for, for participating in this uh, webinar. Um, thanks to our panelists, of course, our homeowners for Sustainable House Day. Uh, thank you to Renew and for the audience in joining us. There was over 400 at, at one point and so many of you have hung on right to the end. So we really appreciate that. And thanks very much for submitting the questions. Uh, I noticed that so many were already answered in the Q&A. So I hope I got to some of the ones that weren't answered yet and that um, multiple people asked. Uh, if you joined us late, don't worry, you can head to the YouTube channel at Renew and you'll be able to watch this session back. And uh, it is the first of many uh, expert sessions. So uh, head to the Sustainable House Day website if you want to have a look at some of the other ones that are running. There's some fantastic panels of people just like this one and different topics as well. Uh, and yeah, I'm really impressed with Renew being able to run this event in a pandemic and webinar environment. I know they've had a lot of practice, unfortunately, but uh, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to visit in person your homes across the country. Uh, in the meantime, head to the Sustainable House Day website. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, join me in thanking our panelists, Griff Morris, Ruth Nordson, Yuri Lev, Robin Rita Phillips, uh, Andy Lanan, and Sarah Laney. And uh, it's, yeah, it's been really great to be your host. My name's Kalia Colston, and I'm gonna hand back to Sophie to do the wrap um, for Renew. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Kalia. That was so fantastic. Um, thanks to all of our presenters, our homeowners um, this evening. Uh, this was such a great start to Sustainable House Day and we're, we're so happy that we're able to do this uh, even when so many of us are in lockdown. Um, before we go, we just wanted to remind you that, as Kalia mentioned, we this is the first of our, I think, nine expert sessions that we have coming up in the next month. Um, and we also have a free day of online sessions with homeowners on 17th October, which is Sustainable House Day. You can register for all of these events on our website at sustainablehouseday.com, where you can also check out all of the amazing profiles and house tour videos from all of our homeowners. Uh, we would love to thank all of our sponsors and our council partners for making this event possible. And with that, I will say good night. Thank you so much to everyone and have a great evening. We will see you soon. <laughs>